Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us at Space Cowboy Books Online. I'm your host, Jean-Paul Garnier, and we are here for Flash Science Fiction Night. I have some wonderful readers lined up for you, and we are going to start tonight's program with K.C. Griffin. K.C. is an award-winning writer based in Southern California who creates internationally published horror, fantasy, science fiction, and Weird West stories. Many of her stories have appeared in podcasts, magazines, games, and Stoker-nominated anthologies. Her weird Western novel, Melinda West, Monster Gunslinger, described as a blend of Bonnie and Clyde meet The Witcher and Supernatural, is the first in a series, with the second releasing in 2025. She is also the author of the short story collection, Shrouded Horror, Tales of the Uncanny, coming out in July of 2024 from Dragon's Roost Press. She is co-editor and founder, or excuse me, co-chair and founder of the Horror Writers Association San Diego chapter, a writing instructor and member of numerous writing organizations. I'm going to hand it over to KC to read a story, The Sighting. Thank you, John Paul. Thank you for having us. Um, all right, The Sighting. The teeth marks were like none May had ever seen. Finally, May said. She kept calm, though she wanted to shriek in excitement. She placed her ruler against the bark of the tree. Ralph, next to her, pushed a branch out of the way and watched as she measured. Primate-like and wider than human, May said. She snapped photos and carefully scraped out the bark around the bite mark. Hopefully we can DNA sequence any trace of saliva. I can't believe it. May had been fascinated in the creature, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, whatever you called it, for as long as she could remember. Once she started training as a dentist assistant, she pored over Bigfoot forums and blogged her ideas. After scrutinizing photos people posted of unusual bite marks on bones, she became more convinced that the creature did indeed exist. She doubled down on her efforts at the cost of friends and dates. Even her parents were exasperated with her obsession. Why is it so important for you? They'd ask. What does it matter? It matters, May had said. She couldn't explain it. Ever since she was a kid, she had been ignored for being too quiet, too odd, too smart. But now she knew she was destined for something more, to prove Bigfoot existed. She had found Ralph through the forum who offered tours to Bigfoot scholars around the National Forest in Southern Oregon. She would have gone on her own, but reports of missing people, often Bigfoot hunters that got hopelessly lost in the vast forest after wandering from their guide, had prompted her to take extra precautions. She wasn't going to make the same mistake. When she had met Ralph at the visitor center that afternoon, she quizzed him. He needed a shave beneath tired eyes, and his cargo pants could use an iron, but he was sharp with his responses. What does Bigfoot eat, she asked. Simple question, not so simple an answer, he replied, and leaned against a wildlife display. Eyewitnesses suggest it isn't fast enough to catch a deer or strong enough to wrestle a bear, but size-wise it would need a lot of food, he said. That's right, she said. Cryptozoologists believe Bigfoot hunts large game. Some think it's smart enough to trap animals, maybe small mammals. What about vegetarians, she asked. Ralph shook his head. Accounts of bone stacking, droppings, and teeth marks suggest that it really likes meat, he said. Right, possibly a pure carnivore, unlike other apes and humans, May said, and nodded, satisfied that he was sufficiently well-versed and wasn't just looking to rip off a believer like other tour guides. She was also well aware she was a solo woman going to a campsite with a man she didn't know, but his extensive positive Yelp reviews and the taser in her bag reassured her. So why do you do it? May had asked him as they climbed into his four-wheeler. Most people say Bigfoot hunters like us are delusional, she said. Or worse, she added silently trying not to think of the sidelong glances or the muffled laughs she had gotten at school or at work when someone found her blog. Ralph looked sheepish. Honestly, he said, the money's good and I love these woods, but I'm also in awe of the passion this community has. 
And he gave her a mischievous grin. Think how famous I'll be when the first real evidence is found. How famous will be, she said and smiled back. Don't get distracted, she told herself. But it was rare to meet a guy who didn't complete, completely write her off, who understood just what a big deal this could be. His four-wheeler had jostled over rocks as they traveled north. She had been quiet, making a pact with herself. If she didn't find something this time, maybe it was a sign that she should give up the search for good. She couldn't spend her life chasing an invisible monster after all. It was now or never. They parked, put on their backpacks, and dove into the brilliant green to a spot she had traced as the epicenter of the last three sightings, finding the telltale marks on the tree a few hours later. Could be a wild boar, Ralph said now, touching the teeth marks in the bark. Nope, May said, and inhaled the scent of dirt and wet leaves, feeling more alive than she had felt in a long time. This is almost a two-inch tooth impact mark. No other known animal could do this. It's not what I need, but it's close, she said. What do you mean, Ralph asked. It's all in the teeth. The back teeth, to be exact, she said. I believe Bigfoot has a, has a distinct pattern of modified carnosal molars, unlike any known primate. Sharp back teeth, essentially, for tearing into flesh. If I can get some clear pictures of that, it would be evidence of its existence. And it would help us understand if it's a totally new kind of ape. Most people come in with vague ideas and no idea how to track, Ralph said. He looked more alert, excited even. But you actually have a good theory there. May tried not to blush as their eyes met. She couldn't remember the last time someone complimented her in real life. Ralph cleared his throat, ran a hand through his uncombed hair, and glanced down at his, his watch. Getting dark, he said. We should find a campsite soon. I'm starving. I'll scope for a spot while you finish looking around. Sounds good, she said. Do you want to make cut off, gasp, and lean down to brush away leaves to glimpse a flash of white? A pile of bones stacked in neat crisscrosses, large bones. She dropped her bags. Oh my God, I need to take some pictures. Did these look like deer bones, she said. Ralph peered down in the dimming light. Wider than deer, I'd say. Look at how they're stacked. There's real intention there, May said, and blinked back tears. All that time alone, all the friends she hadn't made, all of her countless hours looking, finally meant something. Any chance it could be a coincidence, he asked. It's way too symmetrical, she said. The stacking indicates a ritualistic ob observance, almost like a burial. She steadied her trembling hands to take pictures. This, together with the teeth marks and saliva samples, and she'd have it. The world's first real evidence of Bigfoot. She'd give interviews, maybe even be on live TV, possibly a book deal, funds and teams to continue to track and understand Bigfoot. She'd be the ne next Jane Goodall. This gives weight to the theory that Bigfoot is extremely intelligent, and potentially communicative, she continued, hushed. Ralph, I think we're close, like actually close. We have to keep going. A branch snapped, and she looked up to see Ralph, looming and shaggy in the snatches of light, his figure seeming taller by the second. You're definitely on its trail, but let's eat first, he said and yawned. That's when she saw his teeth. The end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Casey. Next up, we have Laura Blackwell. Laura is a Pushcart nominated writer of speculative fiction. Her stories have appeared in magazines and anthologies, including Nightmare, Pseudopods, Cats Cast, and Shirley Jackson Award nominee, Sheral Mad Five. She is copy editor for The Deadlands, and she and Daniel Marcus co-host the online reading series, Story Hour, which I highly recommend to all of you that enjoy watching stories. I'm gonna hand it over to Laura for her story, In My Forest of Inky Night. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Thanks for having me here. Well, it's hard to follow that, but I'm already queued up, so I guess I gotta. Um, this story appeared in Wild Blood in October of 2023. This is In My Forest of Inky Night. 
In life, I had a ritual with the letters I received. Once I'd absorbed their meanings, I took the letters out to my forest and shredded them with my hands, tearing across their secrets so that no one else could ever claim them. I mixed the letters with the leaves, allowed the rain and the worms to make them into soil. Sometimes birds took shreds of paper to line their nests with words. From the secrets I kept, life sprang forth unabashed. The care facility where I died was clean, sterile, colorless. Pleasant, if you find it reassuring to be so far from dirt. I missed the smells of clay-rich forest soil and yellowing paper. In bland surroundings, I too became colorless. My skin as thin as the onion paper upon which I wrote my poetry. My veins as blue as ballpoint ink. No one came to visit me the day I died. My brother-in-law, the husband of my late sister, did not visit every day. He's a decent man with a sense of duty, but visiting that pale, glossy surfaced room more often than he visited my little house would have implied a closeness between us that simply did not exist. Neither of us visited one another much on the mountain, and leaving the mountain was a step further than either of us liked to take. He's gone now, moved in with one of his daughters and never came back. My house is gone now too, torn down to make way for something more modern. Nobody touched the forest. My relatives still say it's a pity I didn't die in that house, stretched on the sofa in front of the fireplace, rereading Emily Dickinson and Edna St. Vincent Millay, and that it would have been kinder if my heart had stopped while I sat on one of the two rockers on my tiny porch, drinking my coffee and smoking a cigarillo as I looked out into the mountain woods. I heard them say so as they sat on that now empty porch, the embrace of my forest all around. I built that snug little house, every corner considered, to be near my beloved sister. She was all the company I needed. Although her husband was not thrilled to share his retirement with me as well as her, I heard the grumbles about unnatural, usually in reference to my preference for trousers or the fact that I never married. But he accepted my presence because she loved me. When she died, he and I kept out of each other's way. We shared a driveway, but it's a big mountain. In fact, years and years ago, I was engaged to a young man. He died of blood poisoning when the dye from his socks seeped into a blister. This is a thing that used to happen. No one would believe it now. My sister's daughters and her daughter's sons and daughters came to visit me every year when they came to visit my brother-in-law. There was little for the children to talk about with me and perhaps they were intimidated by this old woman with steel-rimmed glasses and steel-colored hair. So they flitted about my house, flipping through my books and rearranging my penguin figurines as my nieces chatted pleasantly. Then they would go back to their faraway homes and the forest and the books and I were alone together on the mountain. No one but me was ever comfortable staying in my house where the water from the board well smelled of sulfur. The guest room saw little use. Even now, dead, with decades, to harbor resentment or regret, I am not certain that I mind. Tiny as my house was, it took my relatives years to empty it after my death. No one wanted to sell the house and burden my cantankerous brother-in-law with a neighbor to share his driveway. And from what I gathered, they were sad to take my house apart by stripping it of my things. We had not known each other as well as they might have liked, and dividing my possessions among them, perhaps they felt they were dividing me. Foremost among my possessions were the books. The books I read, some inscribed in handwriting only I can identify, given to me under pet names only the giver ever knew, signed in loops that meant nothing to anyone but the two of us. The books I wrote, in stenographers' notebooks and reams of unbound paper, my diaries and my poems stacked in boxes on the floor of the guest room closet, the puzzle of my writings, all undated. I expect I shall always remain a woman of mystery. In my bedroom, 
heavy 78 RPM records in their lovely slip cases lined the lowest bookshelves. Caruso, symphonies, ballets. I had no player with which to extract the music from them. My topmost closet shelf, well above my height, held a box of my greatest secrets. Envelopes emptied of correspondence. Friends my family knew, friends they did not know. One envelope from a famous lesbian poet. Like the books, the envelopes absorbed the scent of the forest woods. My relatives probably assumed that I burned the letters in my fireplace, but that is where I burned the bills once paid, the tax returns, all the things that did not matter and were not worth keeping. My diaries kept my worries and observations, encoded in my crabbed hand in fading ink. My poems spoke my dreams. The letters held the secrets of others. They held the stories we told one another, the dreams we shared, our thoughts on one another's poems. They are my secrets, my loves. They were never meant for the eyes of whoever was cleaning out the house. Now a wraith, lighter than Giselle, I walk the mountain woods at night. Although my secrets died with me, they sprouted new trees, birthed new seasons of bird song. My letters have become my forest. My forest has seeped into my books. I am dissolved in the ink, the paper, the leaves. My books are scattered across the country, but I have not been divided. In death, I grow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lara. Next up, we have Denise Dumars. In addition to publishing hundreds of articles, poems, short stories, and reviews in magazines and journals, Denise has published several volumes of poetry, two volumes of short stories, and two nonfiction books. She has been nominated for the Risling, Dwarf Star, and Pushcart Prize, and more. Her science fiction poetry chapbook, Cajuns in Space, won third place for the Elgin Award in the chapbook category. And her most current science fiction chat book, poetry chapbook, Mars Maundering, has been nominated for the Elgin this year. She has science fiction and horror stories upcoming in Weird Fiction Quarterly, Worlds of If, Experimental Files, and her story, Trophy, co-authored with Kevin Janderson, will be published in a volume of his collected short stories. Denise has been a college English professor, a librarian, a literary agent, an entertainment journalist, and she's now a full-time writer. I'm going to hand it over to Denise to read her story, The Red Ocean. Thank you. The Red Ocean. I stand by the Red Ocean on this extrasolar world. I record data, select specimens, take images. I declined color correcting lenses, for I can see blue waves at home. I want to see this red ocean, the clouds the color of clotted blood, the stationary life forms. Maybe they are plants that shade from mauve to merlot. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, the sky is navy blue. Now that's unusual. And I'm sure our atmospheric physicists will find a reason for it. Machines could do everything I'm doing. So I have to assume that I've been sent here for some reason other than data, specimen, and image collection. They apparently want my firsthand experience, my personal opinion, unlike the opinion that will come from the scientists that analyze and interpret my data, specimens, and images. Something to my left is stalking me. I've seen it from the corner of my eye numerous times. It must have some natural, say, cloaking ability. It tries to stay on my left side. Perhaps it has noticed that this is my non-dominant side. But would it even comprehend bilateral symmetry? So while I enjoy the sounds of the small red waves as they crest and then slide lightly onto the black sand shore, I am also both intrigued by 
and terrified of whatever is stalking me. The section of its body that I have glimpsed appears to have fur, though it could be feathers or cilia or something that we Terrans don't have a name for. Whether it is animal, veg vegetable, fungal, or some other kind of living thing is unknown, but I can only describe it in terms of comparison. So to me, it appears to be a hairy beast. I want to say a bear, although this description does not do it justice. Is it an existential danger? Well, women and bears have cohabited before, if you believe the literature, and my stalker has had more than enough time to seize me, yet it hasn't tried. So I turn and walk toward the cairn. It's down the beach. My colleagues will want to know whether it appears to be made by sentient beings or by nature's forces. So far, no darting predators have come from the sky or the sea, and the atmosphere has not corroded my protective gear yet, although the radiation from that sun must be as deadly as ours, given time. The bear follows me. My boots don't stick. This shore appears to be covered with fine volcanic sand. I wish I could touch it with my bare hands. I am an aficionado of texture. As I approach the cairn, I think about how even on earth, humans disagree on whether some relics are nature or artifice produced. Is the Bimini Road a natural rock formation or the pavement of sunken Atlantis, Aztlan, what you will? As I grow closer to the cairn, it does appear to be a pile of volcanic rock, perhaps hibiscipal, although I prefer the term plutonic rock. I now think the color correcting glasses would have been a good idea. Suddenly I feel a bit vain for refusing them. My head whips around at an unidentified sound behind me, but I do not glimpse the bear. In fact, in some strange way, I miss its presence. I am perspiring now. I dial down the temperature in my suit. When I see nothing, I approach the rocks. Upon closer examination, I feel that some intelligence has graded and sacked them. Yet we've seen no sign of any civilization here. It's a curiously human thing to make a cairn, often created as grave marker. I saw small stacks of pebbles on the grave of John Kennedy Toole in New Orleans, but ascribing human reasoning to alien logic is, of course, discouraged. There is some space between the rocks, but when I peer through them, I can't see what's on the other side. Obviously, there's more beach, which I'd see if I walked around the rocks. These cracks and crannies contain light and space, but I take a huge step back. This is a machine, or it's alive. The sound of the red waves and the sound between the spaces in the rocks differs. Am I spooking myself? Maybe they are just musical instruments, wind rushing through them, amplifying and changing tones. But there's virtually no wind. The sound from between the rocks is almost like language. My hindbrain suggests I run into the water for safety, as our distant ancestors were thought to have done. I like the red ocean. I do not like these rocks. Their murmur rises to a whine, and I do run into the waves, now can see both sides of the beach around the cairn. And I see my stalker. It winks in and out, its cloaking ability waning. Whatever is between the rocks has seized it. The poor thing gushes indigo blood, struggling in its captors, what, air? Physical, sentient air? Had whatever is between the rocks tried to capture me as well with its light and murmuring? Fear makes my stomach plunge. Literature has described this. The damned thing, the color out of space, it has been glimpsed before, if only in human imaginations. 
Nausea nearly overcomes me as I watch it mutilate the now fully visible bear, maroon fur covering a body, six legs, a silently screaming mouth filled with teeth and tentacles. Death ends the sounds here, then, as at home. And this lapping sea is alive. Its scarlet waves soothe me, surround me, keep me safe, I hope, from whatever lurks between the rocks. A cairn does mean death, then here, as in some perhaps unimaginably distant memory of ours. We have seen all this before, I think, and opinion our machines would not imagine. This is why they've sent me here. I hope to survive until they come to take me home. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. Wonderful stories all. That was Denise Dumars with The Red Ocean. Before that, we heard from Laura Blackwell with In My Forest of Inky Night. And opening up the show was Casey Grafent with The Sighting. Thank you so much to all of our authors for reading this evening. Thank you to our audience for being here. Uh, there is links to everyone's website and, and books, various projects in the chat. Please follow those. And uh, the next Flash Science Fiction Night will be coming up on June 11th. There is a link to that in the chat as well. We'll have featured readers Eliane Bui, Jendia Gammon, and Jonathan Never. So be sure to join us again for another brief night of wonderful storytelling. Thank you, everybody.